Uh, hi guys, I'm Harjot. People call me Harry, easier to pronounce, saves us a lot of trouble. Uh, I'm the founder of a startup called Edger.io. Uh, what we do, what the company is about, I'll tell you at the last slide. But today, basically, the talk is essentially going to be about what blockchain actually offers in the real world. You know, we hear about companies doing this with blockchain, that with blockchain. But as a techie, as someone working in the industry, the real picture is quite different. And today, I'll take you on a low level, a little low level journey. Uh, but yeah, let's begin. So the first thing I'll begin with is essentially, what is decentralization? Quite basic, so everyone is talking about decentralization. How is it better compared to centralization? So what does a centralized anything mean? It means that there is one single point of failure, be it transactions, be it government control, that is what centralization is. Decentralization, on the other hand, means everyone is an equal and, and everyone contributes to something, be it political decisions, uh, be it uh, mapping what transaction to verify, so on and so forth. But there's one thing we always miss when it comes to decentralization. It's not a single faceted problem. Essentially, you can divide decentralization into three different axes. We call them political decentralization, logical decentralization, and architectural decentralization. Big words, what do they mean? Hence the charts. So logical centralization is essentially, if you have something, you divide it in two. Will the two still exist and still function as they are? Example of it, languages. So say I'm speaking in English to uh, Kyle here, and that guy is speaking to her in Bengali. If we stop talking, it doesn't affect the fact that they're going to stop talking as well. And hence this part, which is BitTorrent and languages, which is a logically decentralized and architecturally decentralized thing. Let me backtrack and actually talk about something that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. What is political centralization? So when we talk about a central point of failure, be it a bank, be it a government, why are we craving decentralization? It means if I have to transfer someone money, for example, the only way it can go through is it when it goes through and gets verified through a particular bank's uh, processing power, uh, processing unit. And that's why we have this architecturally and politically centralized things, which is traditional corporations. This is how Google, Amazon, and everyone else works. And where does blockchain come in? It comes in politically decentralized. You know, we, uh, Kyle already explained how different nodes come to a consensus, and that's how everything is proved. So that is what means politically decentralized, and what does architecturally decentralized mean here in this case? Is essentially, did I break something? No. Uh, is essentially that all of us can actually download a Bitcoin mining software, and it functions. One of you drop out doesn't mean that the whole system comes down. But why we need it and how we need it, we'll come to it later. This is a very good quote I found on a Medium article. And that is how I'm going to begin the talk, essentially. We are in the internet age. You know, Kyle's statistics pointed earlier. About 3 billion people use internet? No. 4 billion people use internet. And the way blockchain is going to revolutionize is not by changing services that already exist. It what happens underneath that needs to change. As humans, we are creatures of our habit, right? If tomorrow I tell you there's a new social platform, it is decentralized, it's this, it's that, nobody can trace your chats, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be very hard for you to convince me to switch from Messenger where all of my friends are. But the underlying architecture, the underlying architecture of internet is going through a revolution. And that is what blockchain is offering us. And what is the most fundamental thing of any architecture? It's how do we store data? And that's why I'm going to jump into a quick history of databases, how distributed ledger technology is changing it, what are its drawbacks, and what is a hybrid solution that we are actually using in enterprises all over the world. 
it was 1974, yeah, 1974, this guy called Edgar Codd worked at uh, some labs in San Jose. There were a lot of labs back then. Uh, and basically, he proposed something called relational databases, a model for relational databases. What are relational databases? Essentially, if you have something this and this, the way to store it is to relate this to this and actually create a relationship between different data forms. And that is where SQL was born. The first software system R launched in 1974, first customer, 1977, so on and so forth. But then the internet began and like everyone was in the internet and people started realizing that the amount of data that was coming in and people had to store the servers, they were dying. They, were, they could literally not process those speeds. They could literally not cater as fast as people wanted the solutions to be catered. And then this developer from a company called Last.fm, are you guys familiar with that company? It was a music-based company. Yeah. <coughs> he proposed something called NoSQL databases. Very straightforward name. And the logic behind it was that why the hell do we need this relationship? Why are we overcomplicating our logic in creating these applications just to cater to this one constraint that this guy in 1974 enforced on us? And hence was born NoSQL databases. Uh, MongoDB, CouchDB, Redis, all of them are the same thing. What are they? They're nothing but literal blobs of data. Now, what benefit does that offer? The thing is, when you have relational entities sitting together, linked to one another, it's very difficult to say, pick a point and be like, okay, I'm gonna cut this data, like, better example, I have a notebook, okay? Notebook is full of columns. And at what point do I decide, okay, I'm gonna cut this notebook in half and copy it over to somewhere. Now the question is, why do we need to do that? Because data immutability. You have all these big servers everywhere and the way to actually scale to the problem that I was mentioning earlier, you have to replicate databases. You have to break them apart and keep them in chunks. And with cent uh, SQL-based databases, that wasn't possible. So no SQL database, because it has no structure, it's just a random blob of data. You can literally pick it anywhere, divide it over, and that's horizontal scaling for you. So essentially, these bits were divided into two parts. Something we call centralized databases, which I've explained SQL, and you have something called distributed databases, which can be broken apart and replicated across the world, and they still function. But even of, because of that, they still have something called the centralized and the decentralized management. Centralized management means, so Google, they use distributed data systems, but does that mean that the data that they have is publicly available? Does that mean that someone else can control the data going into Google or not? No. And that's why they are called centralized management systems. But where distributed ledger technology essentially comes in is a decentralized management system. Everyone is an equal owner in the uh, big consortium of nodes or the way the data is stored. So going back to the fundamentals, what actually do you need from a database? Yes, it's a data store, but what functionality does one require from it? Indexing and querying. I mean, imagine if Google existed and you couldn't search Google, what would be the point of it, right? You have all this data, you need some way to query it, to ask it for the things you're particularly looking for. It needs to be fast. I'm picking on Google because it's the most familiar software product out there. But imagine if your Google result took 10 seconds compared to say Bing, and suddenly Bing is good with two second results, which one would you opt for? So. High transaction rates is another big thing. Low latency. Low latency means you go on Facebook, you're changing your user profile, you click save. Imagine it takes you 10 seconds or 30 seconds to actually save your profile and see the changes. That can't be happening. So these are the things that I mentioned that a database really, really needs. Now what does blockchain have to offer? All of us here working in blockchain, IOT, but what are the core, core fundamental principles the reason blockchain picked up? Anyone? Just hit me up. Why blockchain? 
Sec control. Sorry? Control. That's a good point. Remove of control. Decentralization. First point is decentralization. Why? I already explained in the previous slides. Uh, any other ideas? Replication. Immutability, which is replication essentially. Uh, blockchain claims to be immutable, and yes, that is true. So what is the difference between immutability and non-immutability, which, which basically is mutable? Sorry for the double negative. <laughs> so what is the difference? Uh, most conventional databases, you're allowed to read, write, and update. So as I said, Facebook, you can change your profile information. But what blockchain is, that once something is written, you can't go back and update it, because that invalidates the whole chain of events that you have, the whole record of things that you have. But is it really immutable? No, but because if my blockchain is running on 10 different data centers and they all burn down, no. But to a great extent, yes, almost immutable. And what is another thing? Trustless. Trustless kind of goes into decentralization already. This is Kyle's topic, owner-controlled assets, which is the subset of ICOs and the cryptocurrencies we look at. All good? beautiful things to offer, but there are drawbacks. It's horribly, horribly inefficient to store data. According to the exchange rate in June 2017, to store one kilobyte, one kilobyte of data, it cost $1.31. I mean, great stuff what you pointed out earlier, but using it as a core system, $1.31 per kilobyte is heavy a price. Another thing is transaction speed. Sorry for the Internet Explorer logo. I was looking for a slow thing. I couldn't find a logo that explained it. Uh, transactions are slow, horribly slow. As I explained in the previous step, for a database, you need low latency and a very high transaction rate. Bitcoin only processes up to three to four transactions per second. People claim six to seven, but reality benchmarks say it's three to four. Comparatively, Visa, which processes card transactions. They do about 1,700, 1,800, don't quote me on the figure, but it's around that ballpark, per second. Now you see the discrepancy. And as I said, one of the core needs of a database was to have a very, very high transaction rate. So can blockchain actually be used as a database? In one word, no. Tried it, tried really hard for it, no. But is there a solution? Yes. So this is the best of both the worlds. And I'm just going to run you through. This is going to get a little bit technical, but I've tried to stay away from code as much as possible. So we have our application on the top layer. And basically, the alternative is a hybrid blockchain database. This is what, when we speak about blockchain databases, is actually is. So the idea here was very, very simple. You take the blockchain logic, which was the first three things I pointed back in the previous slide, just a processing unit. You take a normal distributed database management system, MongoDB, CouchDB, and all you do is act that three constraints on top of the database to actually make it a <coughs> blockchain database. We do not need to have a genuine linear line of records and sequences. Yes, they can be timestamped, but actually, uh, processing those blocks? No, we don't need it. Because the only thing that blockchain is, has to offer for such a low level thing is those constraints. And those are the constraints we need. How this is going to function, I'm going to talk about in later slides. So, where does it fit in the IT stack? Remember, in the beginning of the uh, pitch, I was talking about how everyone's talking, blockchain is going to do this, people can. What was the example you gave? Uh, farmers are using it to sell things. Excellent things, excellent things. But those are big words, those are big claims. Everyone is using blockchain these days. How does it actually fit into your IT stack? So on one hand, we have uh, centralized applications. And I'll walk you through quickly for non-technical people here. You have these applications with other front-end applications, your mobile apps, your web apps, that sit right there. Then you have the whole back-end system. The back-end system is nothing but what the front-end, your applications, communicate to. That is broken down into the platform, Amazon AWS, example of a big platform people run on. You have the processing, which is of a lot of times called the business logic. So what does your application actually do? 
and that is EC2, GCP, wherever you want to run your stuff. At the lowest level possible is the file system. Where do you actually store your data? And the database, how do you actually interact with that data? In the middle, and this is where most enterprises and most big applications these days are actually using blockchain. These big banks, uh, these big corporations, they're not coming and rerouting their whole architecture and destroying it. What they're doing is keeping the whole stack same, but just for the data where they want those blockchain constraints, they fit in a blockchain database. So for the rest of the things, say user management, user permissions, they use this. But for things like who owns this, who owns that, they use the blockchain database. On the other end is the utopian future everyone is claiming for, everyone wants. But uh, Kyle made some predictions. Sorry, I'm not picking on you. It's just uh, easier to refer back to the previous presentation. Uh, this is what everyone wants to go for. But my prediction is, not for the next 30, 40 years, at least. The infrastructure is not big enough. There are too many problems in the systems that already exist. And to be honest, except the data privacy needs and uh, transaction costs being too high, most of us don't actually have a need except a very small subset of problems to actually migrate everything we own, every utility, every service we own to that. But I'll explain what a completely decentralized application looks like as well. Front end is going to be the same. You know, mobile apps, blah, blah, blah. What changes is what goes on underneath it. So platform, I have written AWS because I'm stupid. It should have been Ethereum. So Ethereum is going to be where you put up your application, where everything happens. Processing on the Ethereum virtual machine. So you use your et Ethereum tokens to actually deploy your application onto the Ethereum platform to use their processing power and use everything else. The file system is IPFS, which is a distributed file system, kind of like uh, StorageX. Has anyone heard of StorageX? So basically, they store parts of your data on a lot of different machines and blockchain database. So. There, that was a hypothetical blockchain database I showed to you. But there is only one product right now which was born out of, actually my ex company's ex-competitor, they moved on to this, so I'm very happy. Uh, they are the one creating a product like this. It's called Big Chain DB. They are based out of uh, Berlin. Uh, great company, great founders, amazing technical team. So what they have done is essentially this is how a big chain DB network looks like. And this is the only slide where it gets really, really technical. So what happens is these are your individual blockchain nodes, as you call them. And all of them control the database. And they are each individually divided into three parts, which I mentioned already. There is the MongoDB, which is the database, the big chain DB server, which was kind of like the overarching processing runner, and Tendermint. I'll tell you how a transaction would look like once in this kind of a system. Just uh, compared to what Kyle was saying earlier about things reaching consensus, it's going to be a similar story. So the client makes a request, which is called a transaction. It's in a JSON format. Does, is anyone familiar with JSON objects? Yeah? unorganized, no SQL data. This is communicated to one of these nodes. We don't know which, just one of these random nodes. What happens is Big Chain DB sees it. It's like, oh, is this a valid uh, transaction? Validates, sanity checks. Then it goes to something called Tendermint. Now, Tendermint is one of these companies that are really, really blowing up. They are not IC related. They're nothing of that such. But they are a purely service-based company. What Tendermint does is it offers a Byzantine fault-tolerant deterministic system, which is blockchain. Uh, are you guys familiar with what Byzantine fault-tolerance means? No? OK. I'll tell you a story. So back in thousands of years ago, there were these, when were the Byzantines actually alive? OK, so then these uh, Byzantine generals actually uh, 
went to a city and they attacked. There were nine generals and the city was all walled. Now these nine generals were quite far away and they had two options. Do we attack the city or retreat? Now, for either of the decisions, they had to reach a majority vote. Now everything would have been good and fine in a beautiful world where five would have voted yes or nine would have voted yes for either thing. But the world is not so, people are not so. So the Byzantine fault uh, tolerance essentially originates from this problem where say four of these generals say attack, four of these other generals say retreat, but one little shithead amongst them goes on to the uh, retreat people and says, oh, let's retreat. So those four generals think that they should retreat. But then this little shit again goes to the other side and says, no, let's attack. But these people, these groups are unaware of this decision. And that is what essentially a Byzantine fault tolerance issue is. And how is it related to blockchain? Because blockchain works on consensus. Should a block be added to the chain? Consensus, 51% majority vote. So what Tendermint does is, how, remember how we mentioned earlier that the transaction place was so slow, 20 seconds, uh, 20 transactions per second for Ethereum, three to four for blockchain. Now, why does it happen? It happens because of the proof of work or proof of stake algorithms, which are what we call synchronous decisions. Synchronous means that they have to follow a certain timeline. So what Tendermint came up, it, it was actually a 21 year old university guy who just came up with this algorithm during his PhD and he's now a multimillionaire. So he came up with the algorithm like, why do we need to keep it so slow? Why does it have to follow a certain timeline? So he went and created this uh, alternative proof of stake algorithm, which he calls weekly synchronous. Now the details of it can be a part two of this pitch, which I'm not going to go into. But anyway, so Tendermint is the one that actually applies the blockchain principles. What it does is it transmits that initial transaction data to all the other nodes in the system. Same process happens for all these systems. And then the Tendermint amongst themselves reach a consensus. Then it returns back a commit message. All good. The transaction is valid. If the blocks are empty, it creates a new block, blah, blah, blah. And then all of this data is actually written to MongoDB. Pretty straightforward, right? We are not actually, oh, sorry. We are not actually storing any data on the blockchain itself. We are actually storing it here, but all the processing is happening here. Well, that was the end <laughs> of uh, how a blockchain database actually works. But I'll go, I'll just take two minutes more, is that okay? I'll just speak about my company and how actually what I was talking about is used in a real world application. So to begin with, Edgeo is nothing but a proof of ownership and trackability platform. Uh, last year during my thesis research, uh, I came up with this distributed crawling strategy, which basically allows you to do a single pass of the internet and create, uh, like look at media files in under five hours which is the entire internet I'm talking about, public internet. So with that and the benefits of the blockchain technology that I was reading, I decided to come up with this company. Uh, we are based in Edinburgh, started a couple of months ago. We have raised some funding, looking for distributed systems engineers and uh, some AI specialists as well. So the way Edge works is you are an artist, right? Everything you put up, is your hours and hours of hard work. You take these pictures, you share them on Instagram, Facebook, whatsoever, whatsoever, to promote your art. But with the trend of social media going up and up, we have become horrible people. We just go there, we see a nice picture on stock photos, take a screenshot, save it, and use it wherever the hell we want to use. But if that artist was using Edgeo, what would happen? They would go to their platform, link it with Edgeo, Whenever they share a content, using uh, the whole AI algorithm that I was talking about, we create a unique fingerprint. Imagine it's almost like a kid sitting and seeing this picture and memorizing that picture. Once that memorizing has been done, what the system does is it checks whether on the existing database that we have currently, does that match anything I've seen? No? Good. 
then it goes through the whole process and adds it to the blockchain database. Now that it's there, we know there's an immutable proof that this is the guy who took this picture and it's saved there. It's just not for photographs. We have music services as well, but slowly and slowly trying to migrate to video, but it's taking a lot of time and hence the recruitment pitch. Uh, next step, what happens? So the blockchain recognizes a new thing has been added and it adds it to a job queue. So next time the tracker comes out and the tracker is nothing but imagine like these little spiders, right? Little spiders and they each pick a tunnel of the internet and just scour through and run into different directions. They are intelligent enough because they can communicate to the database and know what they already have seen. If they encounter a match or a similarity thing, they are like, oh, notify that user that something's happening. The notification goes through, the user sees it, and the user then can decide whether to A, do nothing about it, you know, yellow. Two, contact the people who are misusing your photograph, misusing your music, and ask them for A, credibility, accreditation. A lot of time artists want to promote their work, but they just want to uh, have their name on it, you know? And the third is, we ask them to pay uh, royalties. If that nothing of that works, we have partnerships with certain legal teams uh, at the moment, just in UK, who can send them cease and desist and, you know, get your stuff taken off. But uh, I think that's enough of me for today. And thank you for listening. Thank you for being such a good audience. Cheers. So uh, we're going to hand over to uh, do some Q&A now. So I think, you know, firstly, thanks, thanks so much, Harry. Thanks so much. Uh, you've had so much, uh, you know, you've given us a great overview of, of the business of, of, uh, of blockchain and uh, the business applications in the future where that's going. Harry, given us a, a view under the hood of, uh, of, of how I actually make that work. And uh, so guys, I want to uh, hand over to you guys for uh, questions. So who's first? Amazing. Just uh, state your name and please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just, uh, just your name, where you're from, and then the question. Thanks so much. Hi, uh, I'm Al from Hot Glue Technologies. Uh, I have a question for the first speaker actually about um, some of the examples you gave for these coins um, involve real world products and things. So like the, the gold and silver trading thing. It's like, okay, so now you create a, a virtual representation of it and you, you can sell that or whatever. Where's the real thing go? This one on you. Yeah. Um, so the, the particular example that I gave you there for the gold and silver, that, uh, that business, Astoya, they have vaults in London and Switzerland, and they're also in the process of purchasing one in Singapore where they're going to keep the actual gold and silver. And the purpose of this is that where you sell gold and silver at the moment, one of the highest costs, uh, well, where you, where you own and where you sell gold and silver at the moment, one of the highest costs is one, um, custody. Where do you keep it and how do you keep it safe? And two, transit. If you sell it to somebody, you have to send it to them. So at the moment, there's a couple of options there. One is you sign it over to them. You both have to go and attend the vault, inspect it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the moment, these guys are have vaults in London and Switzerland where they will sell the tokenized version of the gold or the silver as an investment. And then that token represents the asset. You transfer it and the new holder then can go and visit their gold or silver or they can just be happy in the knowledge that it's there with a underwritten in, uh, legal company. So. That's one example. It's probably a good example of it. Um, there's other ones out there. Uh, there's there's a business that I, I spoke to reasonably recently. It dealt with artwork. Um, just funny enough, for what had his recent example, <laughs> um, they were tokenizing art and, and the buying and selling of art. And essentially, it was you can own a piece of artwork that is on display in a museum. You can own a piece of artwork that is on display and even in somebody's private uh, private estate. But at the moment, if you want to buy or sell that art, it has to go to auction. Then the, the, the new owner would typically go and bring it back. And then they could put it out to a museum or they could put it out to an art uh, an art display. These guys are, again, tokenizing it. And the token represents that piece of art. Uh, that in particular company said that their target is to tokenize the Mona Lisa. Now, best of luck to them. I can't see, it. <laughs> I can't, I can't see them going for it. But you know, th there is physical assets on the back of asset-backed now, not all tokens and cryptocurrencies are asset backed. Some mm. of them are backed. So, some of them are based on um, 
value of token is in reality to a, a digital thing. So you could have processing power, storage. Um, some of it is literally used for, for gas or for um, gas. Gas is a term that typically gets used for, for NEO or for even Ethereum and things like that, where you're using that token as a currency for the platform. So to pay for your usage of the Ethereum network, as Harry pointed out, you would use your uh, Ethereum tokens for that transaction and you'd be charged at that. So depending on the nature of the business represents how that in particular token is valued and how it's used. Mm. help so, at all yeah yeah it's a, going back to like the gold and silver thing how does this differ from like a bank where you get a bit of paper that says this is worth a little sliver yes. of gold in a vault and we're going to look after it for you and we're the single point of failure so it comes back to um immutability and to speed of transaction and and things like that so a bank at the moment um can hold your money your currency your assets for you and can put on a bit of paper that bit of paper can be lost, can be corrupted. If the bank has a malware attack, then it can be manipulated, held hostage, whatever the case may be. I'm using malware and things like that. When I say a bit of paper, I mean mm. a record. I'm yeah. not actually meaning a physical bit of paper. Um, the blockchain-based tokenized assets are immutable, as, as we discussed. And then also you have the speed of transaction. So the platforms for Astoria, as the example that we're going on to, uh, they can transfer assets and in real time. There's, there's the point that Harry raised around tra transaction speed block size so it could take you know a few minutes but that's better than having to contact a bank having to sign documentation having to go over due diligence etc etc if you have the the finances and the capital to buy a bit of gold you can go onto this platform buy a bit of gold off of somebody at whatever they're willing to sell it at at that time and you will receive that gold and you will be the owner of that gold as soon as you receive the token within minutes and everyone throughout the world, based on the blockchain, can go and have a look at the blockchain, see who owns what gold and where it's kept, <laughs> all that sort of good stuff. But see how much gold I own and where it's kept. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it depends. It depends on how much how privacy you want. What, so, to, what token you'll use. I, I know some gold and silver buyers, and uh, they do it specifically because they can bury it in their garden and know exactly where it is and who's got it you know <laughs> yeah, and, and and there's a lot of people that still do that and then th th there's a novelty in that as well so. yeah sure <laughs> okay thank you cheers there's definitely a certain immutability of having it buried in the garden but yeah well yeah cool thanks Carl. uh questions christian Um, right, so so I have um, I read about this new consensus mechanism, which is proof of space and time. It's being developed by some researcher. <laughs> Actually, it's it's I, I would like to get some input out of both of you, right? For, for Kyle, because you did some research, obviously on the on tokens which which utilize um, the empty storage that people have on their hard drives. And so the, the idea of proof of space and time is that uh, you use the empty storage that people have to to have to mine the the coin. And like the the concept is that people have a lot of empty storage, so there wouldn't be an incentive to do farm to to like uh, buy and make farms mm -hmm. for for farming the coin, because people can just do it inherently because there's a lot of empty storage. Do you know if there's a lot like how effective are the coins that that, that offer storage space based on this? So I I'm not familiar with the term, but the, the concept that you've described, I'm familiar with. There's actually a, a really good um, project down in England that are doing something very similar. And in terms of success of tokens that I've seen, I haven't actually seen any token that works on that basis be successful so far. Mm. Now, I'm aware of them, and it's because they're in their infancy. Uh, it might be too early to tell if those things are going to be successful or not. Now, I think it's a great idea. I think you, you look at Bitcoin mining, mining farms as an example, you know, some ridiculously big ones that are p p pulling out you know 300 million in investment simply to open up a farm and, and just you know set up a, a load of servers with a load of processing power that can li literally just r rally through if there's a process there where you can then put your hand up and say i'm happy to join a mining pool or whatever the case may be you can use my processing power or you know I, I, I work for a company and I'm on the night shift and I know that they only use 10% of their servers so I'm going to fire out the other 90% in, in my spare time you know, anything it makes total sense to me, you know, yep. use efficiency, use capacity management. If you have availability there, use it. I think that those kind of concepts will be successful, but then it depends on how big a fish you're going to be in, in the big wide world. So you see 300 million pound mining farms being set up in America and things like that. Is, you know, somebody sitting in their basement joining a local mining pool going to be able to compete with those guys? Probably not. If the mining pool gets big enough, who knows? 
Um, yeah, maybe Harry, because you're the technical guy, have you heard about the concept and do you have some like, outside input? Because I just read the, the paper and I would love to, you know, maybe chat to somebody about this. I mean, this. I, I don't think I've read the paper, but the concept right. sounds very familiar. Uh, I don't have an answer to whether it's going to be successful or not, but it's going to be a reverse question to you and then I'll probably ask you, to what extent or to what need is such a token being launched? What is the point of it? to essentially facilitate this, this decentralization because as um, Kyle said you know 300 million farming mm -hmm. uh, Forms, right? You, it's getting more and more centralized. Centralized, you lose this, this, you know, um, empowering the people. And and the idea of this consensus method is that there's so many people have so much free space. It wouldn't make sense to to build a farm around this. So to essentially empower the users again, as as Bitcoin originally intended. So because space, the storage space, is nothing but dumb circuits that you store stuff on. So does the consensus work by how many, how much storage you have and how many, how much different storage? Yeah, essentially the more free space you have on your hard drive, the, the more you are going to contribute to the consensus. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I don't think it's gonna take off because if it does, then Amazon probably will own most of the tokens. <laughs> that, was my, that was my thinking as well, right? Yeah. I yeah. think consensus algorithms should be something that everyone has an equal right to hence us going away from the synchronicity of the most consensus algorithms that are out there because you just with a mobile phone should technically have the same rights or the same laws as someone with a server farm which takes 300 million that is the point of decentralization otherwise we are trying to go away from uh, capitalism to just create a bigger you know much much more bloated version of capitalism seems like that's uh, at the yeah. moment yeah. It seems to be this sort of continual cycle of creation and destruction of new paradigms <laughs> that you know it becomes decentralization and then a good idea kind of kind of gets gets picked up get you know it gets mass adoption and then it becomes almost recentralized around new nodes and that cycle seems to be picking up next question oh by the way guys i just remembered something the slides ended abruptly because I think I deleted one by mistake in the end. I was going to talk about use cases, I just remembered, because that was there as well. The, I touched on that point. Yeah, anyways, sorry. I mean, if you want to share a use case. Uh, uh, I don't know where the slide went, to be honest. It well, obviously okay. wasn't on the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's a quick question for Harry. Yeah. So with this, with this app, the user can sign up and say this is my photograph, look for it on the internet. It's, it's maybe not a blockchain question as such. How, how can you search the internet so quickly to find similarities between like pictures and... Okay, well I wouldn't be giving my patent away if I told yeah, you. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the idea is pretty simple. Most distributed searching algorithms, what happens is there is one governing entity and you divide the entire internet into subspaces, essentially, and you give, give these smaller spiders, let's call them, to search these random parts of the internet. They all come and report back to the central entity, and the central entity kind of like joins it together and creates a record. So Google was the major invention in search algorithms with their page rank in 1999, sure. page rank in 1999, which was up until then, no algorithm had like been able to search so fast or so efficiently. But kind of taking from the whole principle of blockchain itself, like the decentralization itself, the way on a higher level my algorithm works is you, there is a no governing entity and everyone who is using the platform kind of becomes a spider themselves. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. So if you are, so I'm not asking you to mine my coins, mine my tokens, because you don't really need to. And even if you do, you can probably run it on your phone. But if you're giving me 2% extra processing power and I give you discounted rates, wouldn't you want to? So that's how the algorithm works. But if you want to get into a little bit more technical nitty gritty, just sure. catch me after. Cheers. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I was just wondering, uh, with the um, 
a big issue over you know the the quite a while for now um in the cryptocurrency space has been the scaling issue um so we've seen uh side chains lightning network um all this stuff uh you know increased block sizes where does that end and where where do you see the consensus um in the community uh, it just seems to be the next sort of solution after the next sort of solution with massive disagreements at every step so where does it come to a head where do you see it coming to a head for either of you you want to go first or? Uh, sure. it's a good question um i i don't see it coming to a head essentially i think it will end up being some sort of an arms race, if you like. So, um, Harry brought out examples of transaction speeds in his talk. You, you can look at the other side of that. There's blockchain projects out there that are hitting transaction speeds of upwards of 40,000 transactions per second right now. If you look at Komodo, EOS is banding around a million per second, whether you believe that or not. <laughs> I hope so. I've got some there. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so um, I, yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. I think the... Lightning networks, uh, again, it's a, it's a band-aid over the, or a plaster over the Bitcoin blockchain. It's, it's not developing a new technology. It's looking at the existing technology and how can we shoehorn it to make it work to the current needs. Mm. I think, as opposed to coming to a head, somebody's going to crack it and somebody's going to get to the point of saying, right, we come up, we've looked at it, we've looked at a different methodology, you know, could be blockchain 3.0, could be blockchain 12.0, you know, I don't know how far it will go, but I think that blockchain as it is won't come to an amalgamation of all the different tokens and all the different projects fighting with each other to try and find a solution. I think there will only be one. I, I'm looking at it right now and I'm seeing, I think, what we're up to now, 7,500 cryptocurrencies listed publicly, um, probably double that, three times that blockchain projects around the world that are, are running in, in isolation without the whole ICO propagation. I, I think in two, three years from now, the cryptocurrency space is going to go from 7,500 down to maybe 50, less than that. I, I think there's going to be a shed loads of projects that are going to go bust. I think there's going to be a shed loads of projects that are going to run out of funding or they're going to be unable to meet their roadmap or unable to meet their goals and people are just going to drop them. I, I think at that point, two, three years maybe, We'll have a better idea of what the future of blockchain is going to be. Right now, we are in the infancy. You know, I pulled up the figures in terms of the amount of people that are involved in blockchain. Um, I, I think there'll be something new. I, I guess I don't think it'll be an adaptation of what's currently there using side chains and all the rest of it. Harry, I don't know if you've got a view on that too. Uh, well, to a certain extent, I agree with Kyle. Uh, looking at the space, it's very, very divided in the sense of uh, people who want to build on it just because they can and they, then they come up with these unique uh, things. But I'll, I'll just go back to the 1990s. I was probably not even born. I was born in 1996, so I don't know much about it. But uh, the way any technological innovation works is what we call a bubble. It's, it's a simple peak up and down. In the infancy, adopters are slow. You know, rewards are not enough. People start seeing it. Hence, these 7,500 cryptocurrencies come up. They recognize the space that the early adopters, uh, sorry, the early innovators came up with. A technology is not born out of the first application that was built on it. Bitcoin was the first application built on top of the blockchain idea. And people took that idea and are running with it. You know, they are obsessing over tokens, everything. After a certain point of time, as Kyle said earlier, you know, they're not going to meet their roadmaps, blah, 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 and it's going to fail. And then all it's going to be is its is its true essence, which is offering those three qualities why it actually took off in the first place. Not the application side of it, but how it's going to revolutionize the underlying architecture of what things are now. You know, internet is there. There's nothing that's going to change the way internet works. It's going to change the way we interact with it. It's going to make our interactions effortless, seamless, but it's not going to change internet itself, you know. You will have these, uh, we call them first world applications that are going to come up, but 95, 98, 99% of them are going to fail. And only the ones that are actually contributing to the service itself, to improving the service itself, are going to stick. Mm -hmm. And now which is going to be which? I don't know. Thank you. 
loads of questions we got onto it. Thanks for for either actually. Uh, so there are many ICOs, you know, and uh, at this point, uh, you know, of time, many have you know raised billions and stuff like that. But this raises a, an operational question, right? Like how how can you you know manage this? Uh, you know, if you were EOS, basically, how can you manage you know uh, some billions you know of of tokens sitting in your in your wallet? Uh, for for example, it brings it brings operational questions like you know if you're having at least nine developers, right? Uh, at the end of the month, you have to pay you know forty k you know <laughs> in their salaries. Um, ha, ha, how can you you know extract this money from Ether and you know pay pay them in in, in pounds? <laughs> Are you asking? For, I mean, I mean, it's it's one of the operational you know questions that you know ICOs and, and community you know tokens are, are bringing. So. As I, as I said, I've, I've worked on a number of projects. The vast majority of projects that I work with pay their employees in cryptocurrency. So um, I think the, the question that you're relating to is liquidity. Um, so how, if, if EOS, as an example, as you stated, had 100 million EOS tokens in their wallet, and that was their operational running funds, are you asking how they then achieve liquidity to then have fiat currency to yeah, I mean, do whatever their operational... If you're a legal, you know, uh, company, like, you, so, you, so you, ha you have so many expenses, right? The, the, answer <laughs> is, the answer is the obvious one. So if, if you look at the EOS um, ICO, the, their 4 billion, the vast, vast majority of that, in fact, I think all of it, come, come to mind, is Ethereum. They, they took all of their investment on Ethereum. Now, I could be wrong on that, but that's definitely the vast majority of it. Towards the end of their ICO, I can't remember what month it was, maybe April, it was actually seen that there was an EOS transaction of something like $140 million that went from EOS's wallet, or EOS's Ethereum wallet, to an exchange and sold. And, and you remember that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so it's, and that's, that's them achieving their liquidity. That's them getting the liquidity out of the funds that they've got in cryptocurrency. Yeah. Now, that's not going to be how they pay their staff. They're, they're not going to liquidate $140 million to pay their staff. Yeah. I, would, I don't know for a fact with EOS, but I suspect they probably pay their staff in EOS tokens as well. All the projects I've worked with pay their team in tokens, with the exception of contractors. Contractors, when you're, you're developers and all that. Developers are hard to come by, by the way, guys. Anyone who's looking for a job who can do back-end chain development, give me a shout. I can get you a job in no time. Um, so uh, t your developers typically will, they, they've got the luxury of being a specialized resource, a limited, finite skill set at the moment, and they can demand paying in fiat currency. But beyond that, every project I've worked with so far has paid their staff in It's, it's a pain in the arse for me, so I, I've, I, well, me personally, I've actually got an accountant that deals with cryptocurrency. I'm having to keep my, my well, luckily it's immutable, so I have to then t take the tokens, you have to take a timestamp of the token value at the point you get given it, and essentially, et cetera, et cetera. So if I have a token that I get paid, that's a taxable t transaction, so I have to take the tax, I take the value of that token at the point of getting paid, That's that goes on my tax return. Then if I turn that into fiat, that's another taxable transaction. So if it goes up, then I have to lose it. If it goes down, then it becomes a bit of a tax write-off. And yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Sorry, extra question. Guys, I'm just looking at the time. Uh, I think we should we save that whatever additional questions to net networking time. We can have those over beer if you guys are right with that. Yeah. All right. Cool, guys. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Carl uh, and. Uh, Carl and Harry, you guys have been amazing. You know, giving us a business and uh, and te technical overview of uh, of the IoT space. Guys, if you enjoyed tonight, if you're taking pictures, please make sure you uh, tweet, share on LinkedIn, all the social media channels. Hashtag IoT EDI 33 and hashtag DLT EDI 7. Watch the space. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks to Skyscanner again for hosting us and for the pizza and beer. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot.